Um, oh, there's me. Um, I'm Eric Demby. I am uh, with my partner, uh, Jonathan Butler. Um, Co-founded uh, Brooklyn Flea in 2008, and I feel like I'm feeding back a little bit. Um, and also um, a, a food market called Smorgasburg, which maybe some of you have heard of in 2011. Um, we also opened a sort of a restaurant beer hall with a food court featuring some of our vendors called Bergen in Crown Heights in August of 2014. Um, I, um, I really like Dorothy's presentation, and I'm kind of happy that um, someone of a similar age group to me uh, presented um, that her presentation had like a sort of, um, uh, wasn't exactly a historical perspective, but a sort of a perspective based on time, um, because it's a lot about what I was going to talk about about Brooklyn. Um, I am uh, someone who has a lot of humility about Brooklyn, and um, also someone who understands that when I talk about Brooklyn, I'm talking about a, um, a tiny sliver of the population of Brooklyn, and that when we're talking about food in Brooklyn, and in general at a food event like this one, um, I'm someone who is active um, with the Food Bank for New York City, and so I always sort of preface when I talk about these things that there's like pickles and pupusas at Smorgasburg, and then there's like people who are worried about their next meal, which is like a lot of people who live in Brooklyn. Um, so it's not, you know, I don't want to be like a downer off the bat, but I do um, often sort of preface when I talk about this kind of thing um, by giving some perspective about that issue. Um, so when, uh, before I started the flea in Smorgasburg, I was, um, I worked for this guy named Marty Markowitz, and he was the Brooklyn Borough President for 12 years, and I was his speech writer and communications director. So I learned a lot about um, a Brooklyn that probably a lot of us don't pay as much attention to, the, meaning the entire borough, the history. He's someone who's about twice, well, he's not twice my age. He's about, he was twice my age when I started working there. <laughs> um, and so, oh, is this thing working? Great. Oh, damn it. The, um, <laughs> The, uh, so I was on a panel with Marty um, about a month ago on the Upper West Side. And um, the Upper West Side is a place where both he and I are a bit like a fish out of water. He doesn't like to leave Brooklyn. He's sort of like Woody Allen didn't like to leave Manhattan. He like, felt like he couldn't breathe like a fish out of water. And um, so every time we were asked a question on the panel, Marty would like, you know, talk for like two seconds about the answer. And then he had this huge list of like, 100 restaurants that had existed in Brooklyn before it became cool. So he was like, his whole thing was how you think Brooklyn's cool now. It's actually always been cool. And it's always been a place with great food. And you know, he, was, he would always make fun of me. He would point over to me and be like, Eric over here is making all this money off a of lobster roll. <laughs> we had, you know, we had, um, we had Lundy's, which was the most amazing seafood restaurant in Sheepshead Bay. And then he would say, we had Evinger's Blackout Cake, which was a famous uh, kind of chocolate cake. And then, I was, and then I was sitting there at the panel being like, well, that's funny, because Oven Lee in Greenpoint is really famous for their, uh, for their blackout cake. And then he, of course, talked about Junior's Cheesecake, um, or Junior's, and they have their cheesecake, but they also, you know, they also serve um, like Jewish delicatessen food. And I was like, well, you know, we got their smoked meat at Smorgasburg. That's kind of famous, too. And so um, I was reminded um, and sort of, I wouldn't say inspired, but in general, when I speak in public, I defer to Marty because, um, and I think about him a lot, because you know, he's sort of like my mentor. And he, he helped me understand that Brooklyn is not a place that was invented 15 years ago. It's a place that has always held, and I wrote this in you know, possibly 500 different speeches. Um, it's a place that's always held a really special place in the imagination, not just of Americans, but of people all over the world. Um, you had Coney Island, which is sort of like the people's playground, the famous Wonderland. Um, the Brooklyn Bridge, you know, arguably the most famous in the world. You had people like, uh, you had Marlon Brando in On the Waterfront and people like Ralph Cramden and the Honeymooners. And really, if you think about the ethnic urban accent in entertainment, people, you know, everyone from like Humphrey Bogart to movies like The Godfather, that's really like the Brooklyn accent. And so Brooklyn was really um, this kind of poster child for the kind of regular guy or gal like working hard toward the American dream. And, um, and so I think there's a lot of relevance to that and you know, it's something I always like to talk about. And so um, now um, you could say, if you were like a marketing kind of person, that Brooklyn was actually 
um, already a very well-established brand long before a, a restaurant like Diner existed or something like a ramen burger existed. Um, and you could say, if you were a marketing person like I sometimes think of myself, um, oh, that's the wrong one. So the, um, that um, if you think of like what's called a heritage brand, uh, something like a, like a brand that get, an old brand that gets relaunched, something like uh, Filson bags or Woolrich shirts or these kinds of things, um, where like a company will come in and find a, find untapped value in something that existed before and that people would get excited about it returning. I have started to sort of think about Brooklyn as um, in that way, where um, even though a, um, you know, no one's sitting around saying, um, uh, what is the, um, you know, uh, well, Brooklyn has like a lot of untapped value and uh, there's no one at a conference room being like, well, let's relaunch Brooklyn. And, um, you know, I think people are gonna be super psyched about it and there's all this great stuff there. But in reality, that is a lot of what's happened. So Brooklyn is, was already famous, basically, right? And all, um, but what's, I think, different about the way Brooklyn has been relaunched is that um, the words that we associate with it, I'm loving doing that, I've never done this before. The um, words like authentic, artisanal, which people make fun of me, they call me artisanal Eric when I'm like at a, if I have a dinner party and I make something sort of um, interesting, they call me artisanal Eric. The um, uh, community cutting edge. So what's interesting is that instead of those being sort of buzzwords that someone came up with to like market Brooklyn, those are things that reflect um, you know, what's actually happening in Brooklyn, right? And so um, if we can say that a borough or a city is a brand and that someone like me um, can sort of have the chutzpah to say that it's based on, you know, this kind of tiny fraction of what's actually happening there, um, then my take on it is that Brooklyn has a lot to do, has more in common with the super friends hanging out together in the Hall of Justice than Superman flying solo in his own movie. And so what I mean by that is that there's not like a breakout star. It's a really like, it's a collective, um, uh, it wasn't, I want to use the word collective, but there's um, this feeling that as more small businesses um, emerge and grow in Brooklyn, they sort of legitimize this idea of um, starting super small, tiny really, with a laser focused specialty. So you think a lot of the interesting brands in Brooklyn right now, they have like one thing that they do super well and they kind of hope to either gain some notoriety and then maybe some investment and scale up from there. And so the power of the Brooklyn brand really becomes rooted in um, all these other smaller brands that kind of come together like the Super Friends in the Hall of Justice. Um, and it sort of distinguishes Brooklyn in a lot of ways from both other cities, but also like your typical uh, sort of corporate brand, which is sort of stuck with whatever, you know, Velveeta will always sort of be Velveeta. Well, Brooklyn can always be, can kind of be anything and it can morph and change over time. Um, and then the other thing that's happened is brands like McClure's Pickles or Mass Brothers Chocolate, those kinds of things, they become these sort of media darlings, right? And they add this element of almost like a mystical power to the brand that you can sort of, you know, and in, in, in much the way as, um, you know, kind of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps in the old Brooklyn to pursue the American dream. These folks sort of started with just pickling a small number of cucumbers in a barrel to having this national brand that's now in Whole Foods, right? Um, I'm not sure if McClure's is Aquaman or if Mass Brothers are Wonder Woman. I haven't figured it out yet. But the, um, I think that, um, and so, um, the other, the, another piece of it that's added even more power to the brand, this kind of like, you know, added to this sort of mysticism about it, you know, which I'm always asked about, that people are always like, what's in the water in Brooklyn that makes all these great brands, you know, it's like, who, who knows the answer to that question? And I think um, a corollary to that is that, um, um, so the sort of, there was a heyday in Brooklyn, the Dodgers left, and then Brooklyn famously had all these urban woes, like many places in America, but Brooklyn became um, almost equally a symbol of um, places where life was really hard, you know? Um, and New York in the 60s and 70s and you know, into the 80s um, was, was, could be a tough place to live. And so on top of that now, Brooklyn has this kind of Phoenix effect where um, other people want Brooklyn to succeed, they kind of, uh, Brooklyn sort of turned into this microcosm of like proving that a big American city can sort of like dust itself off off the canvas like a boxer, kind of like get back in and like, you know, win the championship again. And so there's this sort of um, 
I think everybody here has probably read some sort of article that talks about this where um, you know, America is returning to its like small business roots and um, you know, neighborhoods are like coming, you know, being uh, fixed up and you, you fix up your home and your, your neighbor is doing something, you know, they, they have a small business like in the downtown or in the town or that, that whole sort of utopian vision of um, this kind of uh, return to an earlier America. I think that um, there's become this sort of feeling that if you're rooting for what's happening in Brooklyn, you're kind of rooting for this rebirth of America, right? Which is you know, the same as it ever was. That's how it was with the Brooklyn of, of old. And so when you put all these things together, you can sort of see why the creative class, which is the most sought after group that any city wants, you know, those kinds of, that every city wants those kinds of folks living in their city. And also you can see how every city, you know, other cities, whether it's Paris or Nashville or, um, you know, other cities like that, the, um, they all have like their Brooklyn neighborhood now. And that kind of symbolizes something to the world. And, um, and I think, you know, I was trying to think about, um, what that meant, you know, because people are always saying, they come to me and they say in Paris, uh, it's everything is Trey Brooklyn now, right? Or if you go to, um, you know, whatever city in the world, they're kind of like, go to that cool neighborhood. It's like the Brooklyn of our city. And it's sort of like, what is, you know, what does that really mean? And besides the fact that it's weird, um, <laughs> and, you know, there's also like this kind of feeling of pride that I think you could have if you live in Brooklyn. Um, the, um, so, you know, I kind of geeked out on it a little bit, but the, um, I think that um, my experience of it, at least, having lived there for a long time and having you know, my mom be, and grandparents be born and raised there, is that um, it's like it's really age-old age old, uh, uh, wisdom is that you, people are coming there thinking that they'll find opportunity you know, to sort of like pursue their dreams, um, that they'll be able to do it near other people doing the same thing, um, that they'll be able to do it in an environment that encourages creativity and risk taking, and that will reward you um, not only locally, but at a world class level, even if you're doing something at a pretty small scale. Um, and so, um, so where do um, Smorgasburg and the Brooklyn Flea fit into all this? I actually tried to really de-emphasize talking about our markets uh, for various reasons. I wanted to talk about something else besides that. But um, so our market started um, almost eight years ago now. Um, well, I guess it's really seven years ago. It's our eighth year that we're starting, that's right. So yeah, we started in 2008, which was a different time in Brooklyn somewhat. Um, and so our markets have helped to not only sort of churn out these kind of superheroes of the Brooklyn brand, and also accelerate some you know, huge changes in our borough where um, you know, now Brooklyn is like the obvious tourist destination. When we started out, our, all our efforts were trying to even get people from Manhattan to take the subway to Fort Greene. You know, that, was like our, that was to us our biggest challenge when we launched was like, well, we know we can get people from Fort Greene and maybe from Carroll Gardens and Park Slope and um, possibly places like Clinton Hill and you know Prospect Heights, we our our whole we knew that the success of our markets was going to be based on getting people to come from Manhattan, and seven you know you fast forward seven years and like the Flea and Smorgasburg are basically tourist attractions you know they're like maybe more than half visitors from out of town people come from all over the world, um, and people from all over the world are going everywhere in Brooklyn now and it's so I think just. In the context of what I'm talking about today, it's important just to point out like how mind blowing that is, you know. Um, and so we've, I think that one of the things that the Flea and Smorgasburg has done is sort of be this stamp of approval of sort of quality. It's almost like a safe thing now. If you're selling at that market, even though you're buying food sort of off the street, it's you know you know it's going to be um, the, those folks are going to be well regulated, and you're not you know you're not going to get sick and that kind of thing. So. Um, one of our biggest roles, and this connects a bit to what Dorothy was saying, which I think is very interesting. It's a good corollary, us being back to back. Um, we've been able to basically cut out the elephant in the room for a new venture, right? And the elephant in the room is New York City real estate prices. Um, New, York, New York City's always been expensive. You could argue that it's always getting, it's, uh, it's never been as expensive as it is today, but you could say that any day, really. And so 
when vendors sell at our markets for one, two, maybe $300 a day, that's a huge difference between raising minimum half a million dollars to open your, store, your own store or restaurant. Um, an individual with some passion, actually in Brooklyn we call individuals a collective, um, can sell to thousands of people at our markets every weekend. They can sort of test their product viability, you know, get some proof of concept. They can meet all kinds of different clients and partners, you know, people from stores big and small come there, you know, marketing people, investors, all that kind of stuff. They come and, you know, to discover the next new thing, whatever it may be. Um, and they also have the added benefit of turning a profit on that day. So it's kind of a no-brainer for a small venture starting out. Um, so we've made it really easy for an entrepreneur to start up. And by lowering that bar, um, the markets are large enough to be the sort of cross-section for visitors of everything kind of Brooklyn in the 21st century. Um, so as this, I love this slide. The, um, it's very exciting for me to have produced a slide like this. Um, <laughs> whenever I go to a presentation, I'm like, I should have done that. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm nerding out now. I'm almost done nerding out. So as this platform grows sort of more reliable and established, um, my partner Jonathan and I always say this to the press, that we believe that we've, the markets have become one of the biggest small business incubators in New York City over the last seven years, particularly during the dicey recession years, which are like somehow very easy to forget these days. Um, we have not forgotten about those. When there wasn't a lot of economic hope around, you know, a lot of people, that was when the markets really sort of exploded is when people were maybe trying to save more money or they wanted to invest, you know, spend, spend more money locally, that sort of thing, and help their neighbors, that kind of thing. That's when the, really, the markets really took off was during that recession. Um, so since April, so since April of 08, um, more than 20,000 people have applied to our various markets. It's probably more than that, but I, I can't really keep track of it very well. Um, tons of vendors who launched as these sort of one or, per one or two person hobbies at the markets, you know, really like they still have their day jobs. They are, um, you know, they're kind of like, I'm going to try this out. I would love it if it took off, but, you know, they're not like, they're not betting the farm on it. Um, so many of them now have their own uh, brick and mortar location. Or, you know, are, that it's like now whatever they started doing at the market is their full-time business. Um, they, so they have like established companies now. Um, and it's also really nice that most of them have sort of stayed with the markets even after they've kind of like gone on to their, you know, their bigger thing. Um, along the way, um, Brooklyn and New York have gained new businesses who source materials and ingredients locally. This is my utopian thing. Um, they hire new employees who they generally, you know, will pay fair wages. They purchase their goods and services inside the city. They generally care about their neighborhoods. You know, these are good people. And so this is a list of, these are just um, some of the food vendors who started at the markets who have gone on to have some sort of brick and mortar situation. Some of them are super small. Some of them have like multiple locations like Mighty Quinn's now. Um, we're super proud of this list. There's also like flea market vendors that I didn't put on, that are on a separate list that I didn't include. Um, it's really one of the things that we're the most proud of is how um, people can start with us and launch from there. Um, and so um, the um, so the flea and smorgasburg sort of fit into this nice narrative um, that um, whether it's like the mayor <clears throat> the mayor of a city who want, who's trying to like you know, if you if you go outside of New York, um, most cities and states spend all their time trying to attract. They spend time and money trying to attract businesses. They don't have enough businesses. They don't have a strong enough tax base. Their quality of life, for various reasons, is not as high for that reason. And so, it's important to sort of keep some perspective that most of the world spends time wanting to be like New York. You know, so you have mayors, governors, um, you know, tax breaks, all these kinds of things to attract business here. New York, people just come here to start their business, you know? And so, um, and you know, we're, we're uh, approached like, not on a daily basis, but pretty close by uh, uh, someone from a city government um, in America or in another part of the world. Yesterday it was uh, Puerto Rico. Um, we are approached by real estate developers who are like, you know, I'm, I'm working on this whole swath of land and um, it could be Chicago, it could be New Orleans, whatever. We really want to have a market concept in there because we know that that's good for the city. We know that that's the kind of business we want to see flourish here. 
And, um, and so um, the, um, it seems like I might be almost done. Um, the, um, and so the, um, let me just get to my ending. Um, great. Uh, in a way, it's not so different from the Brooklyn of the past that Marty Markowitz loves to showcase working folks pursuing the American dream in the greatest city in America. Um, 60 years ago, <laughs> Ralph Crampton drove a bus. Today, Mighty Quinn smokes brisket. Marlon Brando could have been a contender. Today, could have been a flea market vendor. <laughs> Thank you.